This is Thursday, April 11, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today William Callahan. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? Uh, yes, uh, March 1st, 1960. And where were you born? Niagara Falls, New York. And I understand that was a short term. It was a very uh, short time. Obviously, I don't remember it. Uh -huh. uh, we were only there a few months. Uh, then we moved to several places, including actually I lived in Wakefield, Massachusetts mm -hmm. uh, for about a year. I lived out in California, Sacramento, California, uh, Buffalo, Amherst, mm -hmm. New York is where I went to kindergarten. And then we eventually settled about 100 miles, 120 miles uh, east of Niagara Falls, a small mm -hmm. town called Newark, mm -hmm. just about 30 miles outside of Rochester, New York. And uh, that's where I grew up, mm -hmm. from first grade to my senior year in high school. Yeah, and what do your parents do for a living? Uh, my mother is a, a retired school teacher, so she taught second and third grade. Mm -hmm. And my father was in uh, sales. Hence the moving around. <laughs> right. And what town do you currently live in? I live in Natick. What's your marital status? Uh, single. Do you have children? Uh, no, I do not. Do you have siblings? Yes, I do. I have a sister who lives in Hudson. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two nieces. And obviously, I have, I have several cousins in the area. Okay. And where did you go to? I, I take it you went to Norwich. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. All four years? All four years. Uh, when I left high school, uh, graduated from high school in May of uh, 78, mm -hmm. uh, August of 78, entered Norwich, and graduated in May of 1982. What was your major? Uh, history. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? Well, uh, being that Norwich is a military school, mm -hmm. uh, obviously they offer ROTC. Uh, so I signed, I, I was an Air Force ROTC, and then I signed my advanced ROTC contract mm -hmm. uh, in September uh, of 1980. So for, actually for retirement purposes, that is the date that they, uh, they use. Mm -hmm. uh, and then was commissioned in May of 1982 as a second lieutenant uh, uh, in the Air Force. Why the Air Force? Well, at the time, uh, you know, I wanted to try something a little different. Army is, uh, Norwich is predominantly an Army school. Uh, and the Air Force ROTC had actually just started like in the early 70s there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just uh, sort of an interest uh, in the Air Force uh, mm -hmm. and uh, enjoyed the experience. Uh, one of the experiences, summer camp, was held out in California. So that was a great experience out of Vandenberg. They also take you up in a uh, T-37, uh, which is the initial trainer jet for uh, pilot training. Uh, so that was an experience, and they basically, you know, you go with an IP, which is an instructor pilot. Uh, they take the plane mm -hmm. off, uh, the jet off, and, uh, you know, a few thousand feet in the air, they actually let you get the controls, and you fly it for <laughs> about a half hour, and then they'll take it in for you. Uh, uh, did you get so, to do any tricks? <laughs> uh, no, no, they're, uh, <laughs> uh, although he did uh, okay. when he took the control. At, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, very, uh, just very impressed, uh, and, uh, you know, I ended up taking a, uh, going into missiles. I was a uh, missile launch officer uh, with the Air Force with the Strategic Air Command. What made you choose that specialty? Well, actually, it chose me. Uh, I think when you're like 20 years old or 19 years old, you sort of envision yourself, wow, California. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the Army camp, uh, they were sending them down to Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina at the time. I thought, well, wow, you know, California. You know, this is like just about an hour north of Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was uh, pretty intrigued with that. So I went to it, enjoyed it. And as I came back, I was, you know, looking at other areas, you know, other AFSCs. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you went to the missile camp, uh, Bill. Uh, you're going to become a missile air. That's mm -hmm. why you went to the camp. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I was committed. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything else you liked about BASIC, especially given the fact that you actually went to a military school uh, uh, physical training wasn't so much a problem for you? Uh, no, it, it really, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think in military in the general, uh, mm -hmm. you know, excluding like special forces type training, uh, it's nothing really that stringent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it was nothing really difficult about the training. Uh, I think most kids, or at least in my era, you know, because most of the kids that went to the military school, you know, had played sports in high school, mm -hmm. were in pretty good shape. 
so it was really not a, not a problem mm -hmm. or anything like that. So it's a little different, the summer camp, because it's uh, annual training for, it was four weeks. So it's not really basic training, uh, which would be for enlisted, uh, which for the Air Force, uh, they, it's at Lackland Air Force Base down in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, this was at Vandenberg. So it's just sort of get you acclimated because within a couple of years, you're going to be commissioned a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So it sort of puts you in uh, certain leadership positions. They want to see how you handle teamwork, how you work in a group, uh, how do you lead from the front. It sort of tests your management skills uh, in certain situations, uh, which, uh, you know, at 20 years old, you're getting some of that at Norwich because one of the advantages of a military school, you actually uh, have an opportunity to, as even as a sophomore, to be a squad leader. Uh, so you have responsibility, you know, as a, as a junior, uh, you could have a whole platoon, you know, as a senior, you could have a whole company or the whole regiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really uh, it gives you a chance early in your life that you might not otherwise have until later on for other college graduates, uh, you know, getting into working for a company, working their way up the mm -hmm. uh, ladder in terms of uh, management positions. So it was, uh, it was a good experience for me. It's probably because of the structure mm -hmm. that helped out a lot. It was, uh, I think if I had gone to a bigger school, such as like UMass or Syracuse University, uh, maybe I would have got a little bit lost in the shuffle yeah. and uh, maybe maybe not even graduated. Well, also given the fact it was the late seventies, early eighties, the attitude toward the military wasn't all that. No, um, and that's and that's true. And it, it, it actually uh, it was a, uh, a little bit. You noticed that in the state of Vermont, uh, one of the advantages uh, that uh, uh, VMI and the Citadel have is because they're located down south. Norwich is actually the oldest private military school in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have your academies, but when it comes to the private schools, uh, Norwich is the oldest, uh, 1819. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but in Vermont, definitely views are uh, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit to the left, uh, but uh, it, it, you know it has changed uh, and. Uh, so you, you felt a little bit isolated. Uh, you sort of stood out, uh, obviously with the short hair, if you went up to Burlington or you went into Mount Pillar. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was definitely a, a closeness among your, uh, mm -hmm. your classmates that you were in this together, which uh, I think really sort of helped form the foundation uh, of the rest of my life, mm -hmm. uh, actually. And, uh, and uh, just to elaborate just on a, a specific part of it, like a, if you, for a memorable part, uh, was my freshman year, uh, and you, you go through the, what you're called a rook at Norwich. I think at VMI you're called a rat, and I think mm -hmm. at Citadel you're like a knob is what they call the freshman. So you have your shaved head, you're a little bit lost, bewildered is probably good ways to mm -hmm. uh, categorize you, yourself. But an alumnus who had just recently graduated a few years earlier obviously knew I was a freshman and uh, it was at the end of the football game and mm -hmm. he had asked me, and I was going to be marching back up. Uh, to go up to my, my room, basically, probably to polish my uniform. There wasn't much for us to do as uh, mm -hmm. freshmen. And he asked me how I liked it so far at Norwich. And, you know, I was very polite. Uh, you know, I said, well, sir, obviously you graduated from here, uh, so it must have been a great experience for you. And then he said, he sort of smiled and he said, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Mm -hmm. You're going to hate every day that you're at this institution. And he called it an institution. But when you graduate, all you're going to do is you remember the good times. And I don't think truer words were ever spoken to me. And mm -hmm. that truly laid the foundation and it benefited me and uh, as being a battalion commander and a brigade commander leading troops, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of deployments in Iraq. Because when you're going through the experience, just like you go through basic training or something like that, it's never enjoyable. Mm -hmm. For some reason, when you complete it, mm -hmm. as time goes on, you look back with different memories. Okay. Let's go back to missile launch training. Was this before or after you were commissioned? This is uh, after uh, uh, your commission. The summer camp was held there for people that were probably going to go into missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual training uh, was held, uh, I got commissioned in May. Mm -hmm. uh, then you're sort of put in like in a reserve status until you go on your initial training. So in, uh, uh, at that time, it, it sort of staggered. You know, some people went like in August, people went in October, each of the classes. My class started in January of 83 uh, down at Shepard Air Force Base uh, in Texas. Out of, it's actually located in Wichita Falls, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also the Euronado school for pilots at the time, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where your initial training is into the, the Titan. And I was becoming a Titan launch officer 
At the time, there were two uh, missile uh, commands. You had the, the Minuteman series, and you also had the Titan. Mm -hmm. uh, the Titan, uh, to give a quick reference to it, is if you remember the space program, you remember mm -hmm. Mercury, you remember Gemini, right. Apollo. Well, Gemini was the Titan missile. They actually launched, the only difference, we had a warhead on ours versus the actual uh, space cast mm -hmm. that was on the Titan II. So it was a pretty big rocket. Uh, and yeah. there was uh, three bases uh, located uh, in the country. There was McConnell in Wichita, Kansas, mm -hmm. Little Rock Air Force Base, and Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and also there was Davis Montham in Tucson, Arizona. What was involved in your training? Well, the training was obviously get you familiar with the complex. There, it was a two-phase training for, uh, uh, for the uh, Titan missiles. Uh, first is to understand that you're working on a four-person crew and the different specific duties that you'll, uh, you'll be responsible. You will initially start as a deputy combat crew commander. Mm -hmm. And then after a couple of years, as you probably put on uh, captain, you'll become a combat crew commander, so you'll oversee the whole complex. Mm -hmm. uh, you have two enlisted guys that actually are part of the crew, mm -hmm. whereas the Minuteman series uh, is really just two officers. Uh, people are probably date myself, but you probably remember the, the movie War Games yeah. uh, mm -hmm. with Matthew Broderick. Well, the beginning of the movie, it shows the two guys in the side. That was a Minuteman uh, missile that they were, they were just two officers. So we had a bigger complex, uh, but there was, it was a four-man crew. And down in Shepherd, it was just the initial, it was about, I think about 13 weeks, initial training. Uh, so you understand about the missile, you understand about the launch, uh, the different systems. Uh, the whole complex in itself, what makes up the complex from the communications gear uh, all the way to uh, different hazards that you could possibly face. The second phase was back at Vandenberg in California, which was a six-week phase which encompassed the emergency war orders. So now you actually were getting training on when the uh, a message would come across the uh, uh, system uh, that, you know, in terms of decoding it, what did it mean, and uh, following certain specific, uh, you know, classified procedures uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, which would ultimately lead, if it need be, to launch the missile. Wow. You know, so. mm -hmm. Which we never had to do, so. <laughs> which it is was a good still thing. the Cold War, though. You never know. And, and, you know, you look back at the time as you're going through the Cold War, mm -hmm. I don't think you really get reeled into it until years later when mm -hmm. they, they really refer in terms of the Cold War and uh, just sort of the, the thought process, uh, uh, especially, obviously, you know, uh, where the missiles were mm -hmm. specifically aimed at. Uh, you just sort of did your job. You know, you didn't maybe get, obviously, in the, in the service, you're not getting involved in the political end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but the history later on in life, you start looking back and you think of that period. And, uh, and it was really a unique experience. Uh, you know, I eventually became a combat crew commander, uh, actually oversaw an alternate command post. Uh, I had probably over, well over 300 alerts, maybe 370 alerts or so uh, during my time. It was actually split between uh, McConnell Air Force Base and Little mm -hmm. Rock. At the time, uh, uh, they started in 1981, was they were going to, due to the SALT talks, were basically taken, the Titan system was going to be deactivated. Uh, so the first base was chosen in Davis Montham, which was my first choice mm -hmm. when I was getting my commission. You fill out what's called like a dream sheet, where would you like to go? Uh, I actually thought, well, Arizona would be nice, it's warm weather. You know, I just spent four years in Vermont, you mm -hmm. know, four winters and uh, <laughs> really no spring. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I look forward to that, but we were told by the class of 1981, some of the people that were uh, stationed at, you will not get, you'll either get Kansas or Little Rock. So, and they hadn't chose the second base, so uh, I picked McConnell. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up with uh, serving two years. Then it was, McConnell was chosen to be the second base deactivated. So then they took a majority of our class that went through training ended up going down to uh, Little Rock for two years. And so they were completely deactivated in uh, August of 1987. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what Little Rock was like. Uh, uh, Little Rock was, you know, what's funny is, you know, you hear these stories. And uh, I have to admit, uh, I think when I initially put Arizona down, I was thinking, boy, geez, if we're not going to get Arizona, I'm not sure if I want to go to Arkansas. I'm thinking <laughs> I'm uh, from the north here. And, you know, maybe uh, there's still some Confederates down there, <laughs> you know. But uh, 
uh, I actually it was very enjoyable. Wichita, Kansas, the same. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is you're in, you're really in your early 20s, still mid 20s. You know, sort of an extension of college. You're having some fun. Uh, but I really uh, the people were very friendly. Uh, I really enjoyed my time uh, uh, down in Little Rock as well as I enjoyed my time in Wichita, Kansas. You know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a great experience, and that's one of the things that you know the military gives you an opportunity to see different parts of the country, and mm -hmm. uh, and thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay, so tell us what happened next. Well, uh, after I, I came out, uh, you know, I was looking. I wanted to stay in the reserves at least because uh, the military had been a big part of my life uh, to that point. So I was looking uh, to go into the Air Force Reserve or the Air Guard uh, coming out and. Uh, I remember one colonel, lieutenant colonel, telling me, you know, sometimes the, you know, it, it always looks like a, a little bit, the pasture looks greener from the outside until you get out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had about half of us decided to get out of the service. Uh, the other half decided to go on. Uh, I think if they had given me a sign, uh, assignment, say, up into the north, like Peace Air Force Base, which I uh, was looking at, it was, the missiles were deactivating. So, mm -hmm. But the Strategic Air Command was very funny that it's sort of like once they get a hold of you, they never release you. Uh, it really was, uh, everything was very checklist oriented, uh, very specific dealing with nuclear uh, mm -hmm. weapons. And a lot of it had to do with the foundation that uh, General LeMay, Curtis LeMay, had built. And when I first came in there, many of the like lieutenant colonels and colonels, when they were lieutenants and stuff, had worked for people when LeMay, that can remember right, Curtis LeMay, yeah. so it was only like a generation or so removed. Uh, that's how much of an impact that he still had on the Strategic Air Command. There, there was just no room for error. So I sort of wanted out of Strategic Air Command because I had heard the rest of the Air Force, uh, there were some unique opportunities, but uh, my uh, dream never came true. My uh, next assignment was going to be in Minuteman missiles, uh, and it was going to be up at Grand Forks. So I decided, uh, you know, it, you're feeling pretty brave, you're a captain, you think you pretty much have the world by the tail. And uh, I told, uh, I told the, my, some of my supervisors, you know, uh, well, you know, either you give me what I want or I'm going to get out. And mm -hmm. uh, they, in their infinite wisdom, said, well, don't let that door hit you, captain, on the way out. <laughs> oh, dear. So this is now 19... 1987. 87. So it's August of 87. So uh, I ended up... Uh, Getting out, I actually worked for a security company for a while in their management training program. Uh, similar, it was Allied Security, similar to like what Wells Fargo does. You have mm -hmm. various, they train you to be a branch ma manager, uh, and you oversee the security of like more industrial companies. Uh, so you, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, obviously looking to do the Air Guard or Air Force Reserve. Uh, many of my friends at Norwich had mentioned, you know, you got to try the you know, look at the, what came down to is the guard portion compared with the reserve offered great educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I also have always had an interest in coaching and teaching. So I looked at it to go back to school to get my master's mm -hmm. and uh, my teaching certificate. So I could end up in the, uh, the teaching career field. And that was probably an influence, you know, because my mother taught. And I thought being part of the reserves and teaching, that would be a nice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I always like to do several things. Yeah, okay. You know, mm -hmm. I have that, you know, I just don't want to be tied into one thing. Uh, so uh, the opportunity came up, uh, you know, I went to a recruiter. And uh, next thing I know, I was interviewing uh, with a, uh, a commander of the 726 uh, Main Support Battalion here in Natick at the time. Uh, so this is right around, like, I think it all started like in uh, winter of 89, like 88, 89, mm -hmm. uh, I started uh, the process uh, looking into uh, the Army National Guard. And I saw the education on the tuition assistance. Uh, so I interviewed with him, uh, Colonel Shea, and uh, he had actually spent a few years at VMI, so he was well aware of Norwich. Uh, and he offered me a company command position. So, and that's, there is sort of like a, you know, each service obviously is a little bit different from another service, but there is a common denominator in terms of command positions. You know, I had been a combat uh, crew commander, and this was an opportunity to be a, a company commander. And Norwich is built on the Army system of company commands, and so mm -hmm. I understood a, a company and, and platoons, and, and he said, we have an opening, and uh, I definitely could see it. However, he asked me, how much maintenance experience do you have? And I said, well, you know, on the missile, uh, 
you know, we would have maintenance teams come out, so as the commander, you would give them a maintenance briefing. And he said, close enough. Would you be interested in going to uh, the ordinance officer advanced course? You'd have to do it in residence, so you'd, you'd, you'd be going away for six months. Uh, it's down in Aberdeen, Maryland. I said, no problem. So I went down uh, and did their advanced course. Uh, I was the company commander of a towed mm -hmm. missile dragon maintenance unit. And uh, then I obviously was part-time doing one weekend a month and two weeks during the summer. Uh, and then eventually I got promoted to major uh, as the support operations officer for the battalion. And then I had an opportunity to, I finished my master's. Uh, during that period of time, I taught one year in South mm -hmm. Boston. Uh, although it's probably arguable if it's if I really taught anybody anything. <laughs> well, let's, but, uh, uh, let's back down a little <laughs> bit here. Okay, you went to uh, ordinance and advanced ordinance in Aberdeen, uh, and you became a major. I got promoted to major in uh, 1993. 1993, and support operations officer. And, and the support operations officer mm -hmm. for a main, a main support battalion is really providing support. Mm -hmm. It's part of a uh, division support command. Uh, so they have various, they have like a supply unit. They have like a mm -hmm. maintenance unit, a transportation. They have all various uh, units of different uh, types. Mm -hmm. So as a support operations officer, you oversee that in terms of operations and missions. So you're on the, the battalion staff. And then you said you were te teaching in South Boston. I take it you got your master's in education then? Uh, master's in history in master's education in okay. at Framingham State. All right. And, and I received that in May of 1994. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I was also like, I taught in South Boston at, uh, for one year from uh, 91 and 92. Mm -hmm. I was also coaching track at Nata Kai. I was uh, assistant oh. varsity track coach with uh, Jeff Stone was the head coach at that mm -hmm. time. So, uh, and then received my degree and. Uh, uh, May of uh, 94, and just right around that time, an opportunity came up to go back to active duty, uh, to come uh, on the active side of the Guard and teach ROTC at Northeastern University. So I, I interviewed, uh, went before the board, and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to get selected. And uh, I spent the next two and a half years at Northeastern uh, University teaching ROTC, which is a great, great experience, I felt. Even though I was looking for, there was other opportunities to go to active duty uh, earlier, mm -hmm. but I really had my sort of set on teaching. And I thought, you know, with this opportunity, it gave me a chance. Number one, I'm teaching in the field. Uh, it's going to look good on my resume. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a chance to go back to active duty and get more active years. Uh, so I thought it was a win-win. Uh, so I was very uh, fortunate and, uh, you know, opportunity. Uh, uh, you see the other civilian schools and how they handle ROTC, which I was very impressed. Uh, the, the kids, the students at Northeastern, I was actually very impressed with the school. And uh, that was, uh, Northeastern is I think one of the better kept secrets uh, in terms, mm -hmm. especially with their co-op program. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a great experience there. And then as, uh, after about two and a half years, I had an opportunity to go down to DC and be part of the National Guard Bureau. So I sort of weighed that because at that time I was thinking just doing the ROTC, then going back trying to look for a teaching job and be on the part time of the side. But at that point, by that time, I had close to eight years of active time. So I figured it might be in the best interest to take, you know, go down to DC. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I was on an inspection team. Okay, and what year was this? This would be 19, uh, the fall of 1996. Okay. So you're in D.C., inspection team, what are you doing? Well, we're traveling around the country, mm -hmm. uh, inspecting the various uh, units in each of the states on their logistical structure in terms of their operations. You know, anywhere from supply to maintenance to management uh, to uh, property accountability mm -hmm. uh, on various levels uh, at the state level right down to just the individual unit. So you would travel, you were on the road a lot, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I was on the team for a little over a year. Uh, I inspected, uh, you know, I was in New Jersey, I was in Oregon, I was in California, Alabama, Texas. So you're pretty much on the road like two weeks, sometimes three weeks out of the month. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of travel, uh, but it was a good experience just to sort of, uh, you know, and having the opportunity to have been at that company level, be a company commander. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we do not give our reserve side of the house a lot of credit. Uh, we expect a lot because even though you're only doing one weekend a month and getting paid for two weeks during the summer, there's a lot of other days that you're given you're not getting paid because in order to handle everything, you know, the evaluations are the same as they are in the active duty. And to prepare for something, you don't really have a full-time staff. You have only a couple of full-timers in each unit. Mm -hmm. So it really takes uh, some unique leadership skills to manage that. And th but coming from that and having a better understanding, I think, it helped me in terms of evaluating units you know, with some issues that would come up as opposed to looking at it as cut and dry. Well, mm -hmm. you didn't do this, so this is what you're going to get gig done. Okay. You know, so. And then uh, after that, I, I became part of the maintenance branch, which I was no longer traveling as much, you know, you know a couple of conferences here and there. Uh, so now I was just involved with uh, overseeing various maintenance functions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, really you're like the liaison with the states. So when the, the logistics from each of the states, say the director of logistics, his office in a state has certain issues they want to uh, talk about or uh, find out uh, what's going on or whatever. What, for various reasons, they mm -hmm. would look to, you would be the point of contact. Okay, and what year was this now? This would be now 1997. 1997, and were you still based in Washington? Yes. Okay. 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 And the National Guard Bureau is located in Arlington, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get used to the traffic pretty quickly down there. But, uh, Better or worse than Boston? <laughs> so then in uh, 1998, uh, mm -hmm. I was actually selected to go to command and general staff school out in Kansas, uh, which I went there. Uh, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be one of the few that got picked to do resident. Uh, so that was a good experience. And that, you know, various levels, you're now a major, so you're on a battalion mm -hmm. staff or you could be on a brigade staff. Uh, so now you're really being trained as more of a staff officer in various functions. Uh, so it was a great opportunity. You're, you're in a, a sort of a small group of like 12 to 14 other majors mm -hmm. uh, with various backgrounds, you know, infantry, you know, like combat arms or mm -hmm. combat support or combat service support. So it's a wide range and because as you go up in rank, you're going to be part of different staffs that uh, you know, underneath, you could be part of a division that have a wide range of things, and mm -hmm. uh, depending upon where you get assigned. Okay. Tell us what happened after that. Well, after that, I, I came back. Uh, so that, uh, so now we're look, going into about 1999, and then it was an opportunity. Uh, my state requested for me to come back on the full time side, and I came back uh, uh, to the state as the command logistics officer uh, for the state. Uh, 1999 and then uh, after about probably about six months or a little bit longer maybe about a year I was assigned out as the administrative officer for the uh, uh, maintenance battalion 726 maintenance battalion the MSB had actually deactivated when the division went away in the early 90s so now they had the 726 mm -hmm. uh, maintenance battalion so as a major year, I was the AO, but also on the military side, I was the XO. So I ran the full-time mm -hmm. staff in the battalion and all the yeah. units. And AO and AO is administrative officer right. and executive officer. Well, you can be the, uh, as the AO on the mm -hmm. military side, you could be the training officer. Mm -hmm. uh, you have sort of like, you have like a dual role. Uh, first, uh, as so we had four units, so we had full-time people. You oversee all the full-time people that are in that battalion. Mm -hmm. My military role was as the executive officer, uh, second uh, to the, the battalion commander. Mm -hmm. So from that, and administrative is like any issues uh, on, on the full-time side that you would be handling. It could be administrative, could be logistics, it could be training. You handle, you, you're the person, you're the point of contact, you're the mm -hmm. go-to person that the, the state would be calling. So here again, I was fortunate, I was living right in Natick. I'm at the mm -hmm. armory here in Natick that is no longer uh, the armory. They've done a pretty nice job in turning they did. into uh, <laughs> uh, condos. Uh, but uh, so that was, a, that was an excellent experience uh, mm -hmm. from there. Uh, I, after serving about a year, I, had, uh, I was uh, called up to the brigade headquarters, which was located the 79th Troop Command in Wellesley, and I became their training officer. I got promoted to a lieutenant colonel. And I was the training officer. And then shortly thereafter, there I became the uh, uh, XO, the executive officer for the brigade. And at the okay. same time, I was the administrative officer on the full time. So now, it's one level up. So mm -hmm. now you oversee all the battalion full time people from the different. There were four battalions 
and then the various units underneath those battalions. So among the full time, it, I think we had about 60 people uh, mm. located throughout the brigade, 60, 65 mm -hmm. people, full time people. So you were responsible uh, in, ter in terms of that. And then from uh, there, I got selected uh, after being the uh, XO, AO, I got selected to be the uh, assistant chief of staff up at the state headquarters in Milford. And this would now be around 2000? Uh, 2001 going into 2002, right around that time period. So you were, uh, uh, where were you when September 11th happened? Uh, at that time, I was the XO of the 79th Troop Command. Okay. And we were actually down at the uh, Camp Edwards at that mm -hmm. time doing some training. Because uh, really with the full-time staff at any level, at the company level, you prepare for that next training weekend. Mm -hmm. So you logistically handle everything. You handle any of the training. Anything that has to be done, that's what you're relying on those mm -hmm. full-time to prepare for that, 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 those drill periods, which are 12 during the, the course of a year and the annual training. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that time, we were preparing for an upcoming weekend that we were going to have down at Camp Edwards with the whole brigade. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went down there a little bit earlier, uh, like about three days before, and we were down there because it was going to be a big exercise mm -hmm. uh, that we were doing. And then I do vividly remember driving my car listening to the radio and hearing an announcement that a plane had flown into the World Trade Center. So I didn't really give it too much thought just because I had heard, you know, I mean, it wasn't the first time. They never said the size of the plane. Uh, they almost made it sound like it was a small plane. And I had heard reports, I think they had a couple that like 30 years earlier that had crashed into the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. Like, a, you know, it was a, if it was a foggy day or something like yeah. that. I just thought that it was sunny. I mean, at least it was sunny where we were that, you know, that it was probably sunny in New York because mm -hmm. uh, it's not too far away. Uh, and then I did hear uh, the loud of the, I think, I think it was the 16s or the F-15s taken off, you know, but not knowing why they're taken off. This is just a normal thing, but you just heard this loud, large, loud, very loud thrust of engines. And I just, just sort of like thought for a second, wow, that you don't hear that too often. And then as I turned on a TV, mm -hmm. Uh, by that time, I think the second uh, mm -hmm. plane was hitting, uh, and you obviously realized something was up, and then you saw all the networks and everything like that. So it was uh, just like I'm sure for many Americans, it's a day they're not going to forget. Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. So what happened next? So after that, uh, I was still I went on to be the uh, assistant uh, chief of staff. So I'm doing uh, that job, which uh, you work for the chief of staff, uh, who's a 06, a full colonel, you're a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're doing various, you're doing a lot of uh, any issues that are coming up in terms of, say, like one of the things that we do, we deal with the congressional inquiries. You know, there might be a soldier that wasn't paid. There might be a soldier that was unhappy about, you know, was trying to transfer to the reserves and the paperwork isn't going. So. You'll get like uh, inquiries from like at that time, obviously Senator Kerry's office or Senator Kennedy's office or Congressman Markey's mm -hmm. office, and your job is really you know you're doing that back background and then answering them and then replying back, uh, and you do various other things, uh, preparing briefings for the chief of staff, you know, for very you know sort of uh, more you know office like functions mm -hmm. uh, that you do as the assistant chief of staff, and then I got selected for a battalion command. Uh, to take over the 726 Maintenance Battalion. And that was the fall of 2002. And uh, of course at that point, late fall, we were starting to receive notice that, uh, you know, get your unit ready, that you, we might be on the short list. So at that time, the Chief of Staff sent me back out to the Maintenance Battalion on the full-time side and said, you know, don't worry about back here, but start getting them ready. We're hearing inklings, no, nothing permanent or nothing 100% mm -hmm. uh, sure, but you need to be out there. And then uh, we got the call, I believe, uh, in late January that we were being mobilized. So really, that's basically from then on, I was there, you know, for the most part, what seems sometimes like seven days a week, getting set for the, we were being mobilized to uh, go to Iraq. And how it worked really on the guard side is you'd go to a mob station first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this is the first year of the war. 
So it probably, uh, probably wasn't a smooth transition uh, in terms of uh, getting the message out uh, from uh, high above, like which units are going, when are you going to, uh, to the various mobile stations. We were slated to originally go to Fort Drum. Some of the Massachusetts units were heading to Fort Drum. Others were heading to Fort Dix. Uh, and then it would be, well, we're backed up right now, so we're pushing you back to later in February. So you'd constantly get these. So finally, uh, late February, uh, we headed down to Fort Dix. And I had, at the same time, I also had one, my peacetime unit, uh, which was a one-tenth maintenance unit. Uh, they were a direct support maintenance uh, unit. Uh, they were actually getting uh, mobilized, too, and they were going to Fort Drum. Right, same period. There was actually about eight units. There was a transportation unit in the state. There was about eight of our units going out the door. And so if you, uh, you know, remember in that time, you saw a lot of convoys. So this is the first year where you're bringing all your, your equipment with you. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, what they started doing was uh, falling in on equipment. So it would stay behind equipment, but you would just leave it there, and then the next unit would take it over. And uh, so that's how they would make it a little, definitely easier to mobilize, easier uh, going to the mob station. But this was, you know, we're convoying down the Fort Dix. Uh, and even though we were just the battalion headquarters and we would get our other units when we got over there, uh, that they would be sort of like a modular type mm -hmm. uh, system where they would pick in place. Like uh, we ended up having, uh, actually at one time, like nine or 10 companies underneath us while we were overseas. Uh, but uh, at that time, it was just a headquarters going. We didn't even know where the one tenth was really gonna end up in Iraq they were going to go under a different command. Eventually, they ended up underneath us, mm -hmm. which was nice to have my peacetime unit. I think they were probably happy, too. Oh, I can well you know, imagine. You know. So how many personnel are? Well, uh, for a battalion, we had, and it rotated because some units would get moved during the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there. We arrived, as I said, we, at the end of February, we were at Fort Dix. Uh, May 1st or May 2nd, we flew to Iraq. So you always remember that uh, flight as you're landing into Kuwait. Uh, and then they, you're in Kuwait for a period of time uh, just to get acclimated with the temperature, uh, do some uh, further training. Mm -hmm. But this is the first year of the war where there really isn't, it's so many units coming over, so much equipment mm -hmm. going into the port, you know, because a lot of it would be shipped too. Like at Fort Dix, you'd have to get your equipment right, some of it would be shipped. Uh, mm -hmm. like all your, you know, your vehicles and stuff like that. And then you would go over in Kuwait, then you'd wait for the, that equipment to arrive. You'd get your convoy mm -hmm. set, and uh, then you would convoy in to where mm -hmm. you're going. We were assigned, uh, our brigade headquarters got a hold of us in Kuwait and said, uh, you will be, uh, you're coming up to Talil, uh, which is an Iraqi, uh, old Iraq uh, Air Force base. It's actually near Nazaria. Uh, if you can remember, the very early stages of that war, mm -hmm. there was the maintenance unit that took the wrong turn. I think it was Jessica Lynch, mm -hmm. and that right. it was right around Nazaria. The base is located about 10 miles from Nazaria, uh, so it's about a three-hour convoy ride in. It's 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 still con it's considered still southern Iraq, uh, so it just was so many troops down at, at uh, in Kuwait that it was just. Uh, you didn't even know when you were going. So it was almost you had to make your own arrangements. It, it totally changed. The second time I went over there, it was much more, you knew, mm -hmm. it was system was in place. Right. Like it, as time goes on, it, uh, the theater matures, mm -hmm. people know their responsibilities, they have a system in place. So everything works a little bit smoother. Well, let's, uh, let's stick to the first time around okay. first. Uh, you've been used to bouncing around most of your life, but this, this little bounce was a bit different. <laughs> oh no, it was you know it's it's the first year you know you're you're, you're seeing things on TV uh, mm -hmm. you know you obviously you have you know my battalion headquarters uh, was probably about I think about maybe about sixty five or seventy but you're going to oversee several units so you're going to have anywhere from seven hundred to nine hundred soldiers at a time mm -hmm. uh, for the you're going to be responsible for various missions right uh, so this mission in particular what we were doing is we were going to be part of a area support group a brigade uh, area support group headquarters and it was a logistics mission we were going to be doing uh, not only base support we were also going to do direct support outside in the outlining area so mm -hmm. I had 
uh, maintenance support teams that were located up in Dimaniwa, uh, a few other areas, mm -hmm. uh, in the Jeff area, not too far from the Jeff, various different areas outside in southern Iraq that mm -hmm. uh, would go there to basically in terms of providing few, whatever the, the support mission called for, if it was in terms of maintenance, mm -hmm. working on vehicles, whatever, we would have teams out there. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was sort of because was, there was nothing there. I guess to describe it because it was the first year, mm -hmm. you know, you hear all the things, well, we're going to have contractors come in. We're going to have KBR come in. And, you know, it's, uh, we're going to be out of here by the end of the summer, you know, once the logistics, you know, once they get that all set with the contractors. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so it's going to be one hot summer, but we'll be home. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people are remembering the first Gulf War where people were over for about six months and then they came home. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get in there and, uh, you know, and this time, you know, we get our equipment at the port. Uh, we get set for the convoy. So we basically convoy in. No security, no. Mm -hmm. yeah, so just that. And I think what you really realize and the most vivid memory I have of that is, and it was just probably just a few minutes into when you cross that border from Kuwait into Iraq is that you know you're truly not in Kansas anymore and you but the, but what really stands out is you truly appreciate the United States and it was probably wasn't more than 15 miles into Iraq and thinking that how could anybody actually live here <laughs> and uh, you know I, I really felt like you know and sometimes we forget just how lucky we are here and mm -hmm. I'm as guilty as the next person sometimes you just get you know uh, set in your ways and you just take things for granted. What and, uh, made you think of that? Just all the sand or just... Well, just seeing the sand, the open desert, like, wow, this would be, and it was hot. I mean, yeah. it was like 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're just, you're drinking so much water. Uh, and of course, once we found out we're going to Talil Air Force Base, uh, you know, since I was prior Air Force, uh, many of my soldiers, you know, they always sort of, you know, there's always a, a you know, some jokes among the services, and they, they look at the Air Force as the easier way of life, and uh, you know they uh, take care of their airmen. You know you're going to be living in pretty good conditions, mm -hmm. and uh, but you know driving up and you see that open desert. You know I, I just to me it was like no matter where you live in this country, you're still living large. You know mm -hmm. I don't, you know if you live 60 miles from a 7-Eleven, you're still living large. So <laughs> I, I, I consider it so there isn't a bad place in the United States. Mm -hmm. So as we get there to Lille, you know, we see the, the, the Air Force wing was already there. And now we're going to be on the Army side, so it's, it, it's uh, sort of like a dual command uh, between uh, the uh, wing commander there and uh, with, for their mission, because they had C-130s, because uh, it is an air base. It was actually, I think, the second longest runway in Iraq. Uh, so we, our mission was on the logistical side, uh, but... Uh, looking at the air side, you know, we just sort of assume like, wow, this doesn't look too bad. You know, we see these big tents, we see this gravel, we mm -hmm. see these huge generators for the AC, and I'm thinking, wow, this isn't too bad. So, I mean, I had told my uh, soldiers, you know, I wouldn't lead you astray. You know, this is, we're going to an air base. This is going to be pretty good. So they said, well, hey, you know, Colonel mm -hmm. Callan used to be in the Air Force, so he, he, he'd know. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, we weren't going to the Air Force side. The Army side, you know, you've probably heard the phrase night and day. Well, it was truly different. Because on the Army side, there were no tents. It was just sort of open desert. Oh, and boy. They quickly pointed that out, like, that's where you guys are. And I said, well, there's nothing there. And then they said, well, that's not our fault. <laughs> so you basically saw the beginnings of, uh, you know, just totally nothing there. And, you know, my, uh, my executive officer, my XO, uh, this major said, well, you know, the bright side, sir, is, you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, uh, you know, the brigade commander says, this, you know, we can take our tops off and we can work like, you know, uh, just with our uh, brown T-shirts, you know, so it will be a little bit cooler. And I said, and this is what you're getting out of this, that that's the bottle being half full. <laughs> but, but, you know, and looking back, is, and then at that time, I, I go back to, you know, what was said to me as a freshman at Norwich, you know, you're going to hate every day that you're here but you're gonna remember the good times. And sure enough, you know, we got through the summer. You know, finally some generators came in, more of KBR came in, you know, doing some of the logistical functions. Mm -hmm. uh, we were originally in this big circus tent. We took over this small building that was bombed during the first war and the first Gulf. Uh, and basically there was nothing there. You know, we were a battalion headquarters. It was really more made for a company size. Mm -hmm. But, you know, myself, the XO, the command sergeant major, and our support operations officer, 
uh, all shared the same office. That's how, you know, there wasn't too many buildings until they started building others and refurbishing other buildings as mm -hmm. time went on, KBR did it because uh, it became LSA Adder, mm -hmm. which it became a, uh, an enduring base, which basically stayed all throughout the war. I mean, so things were being added, you know, they, they mm -hmm. eventually, as I said, once we started getting the AC, then it wasn't quite as bad because at least during the day, you know, it, you could find places that could be cool. They had a dining facility finally uh, uh, that would open up. So mm -hmm. you had AC in that, you know, you didn't want to leave lunch or leave dinner because it was finally cool. I mean, there were periods during the day in uh, southern Iraq where the temperature hit about 145. Wow. And it, it's just, and even though it's a dry heat, I'm telling you, you do feel it. And there's mm -hmm. just no relief. And that was the, the, the thing. You, eventually, as September came on, the night started cooling down. So then, but all it takes is that, like, if it drops like 30 degrees, you'll feel the difference. Uh, having the AC was a big, big plus. Then they had, they went from, you know, we were taking showers. We were basically made our own shower. You know, you took it with a five gallon can of water. I mean, mm -hmm. there was absolutely nothing there when we arrived. And it, we saw a community being built, which was actually pretty, pretty cool. Uh, by the time we left the following end of the following April, it was, uh, you know, it really wasn't bad. I mean, uh, we uh, we actually, you know, we didn't even have portage on, so you had to make mm. your own. Uh, oh yeah, so we finally got like, so you saw like sort of like this evolution mm -hmm. take place of uh, now we're in the Porta Johns. Well, that's not too bad, but it was so hot you never wanted to be in one until, and then finally it started cooling down. Then you had uh, uh, shower tents, which was nice, you know, so you could take a shower every day as opposed to having a five gallon can. So little by little, you know, the dining facility mm -hmm. and the weather started changing. Uh, it became a very livable place, okay. and uh, you adjusted to it. And uh, in terms of the missions. Uh, we were all over southern Iraq uh, supporting, uh, you know, uh, Marines, supporting Air Force, uh, supporting coalition forces. Uh, so it was uh, a very uh, unique uh, time for supporting uh, an opportunity to work with other services, other coalition forces. Uh, so it was really, uh, I look really fondly back at that, that, mm -hmm. that time, seeing it from the start to the finish, and then. Uh, then hearing reports in later years with other units that had gone, you know, they have a new gym, they have all these things that are, you know, all the creature comforts of home. And, uh, and uh, but seeing it as we live, we saw it from the very beginning, which mm -hmm. was uh, pretty cool. During your first time in Iraq, did you ever have contact with the local population? Yes, we did. We actually, that was the initial uh, in hiring some of the local nationals that would come on. A lot of the Iraqis that in the uh, local villages would come on for work. Uh, so we actually handled that mission. We did a various mis uh, missions. We also had a you know quick reaction force. So even though it was a logistical assignment uh, and turning handings of logistical support, we did uh, you know some of the other things because it was sort of like you know you had to be a jack of all trades mm -hmm. uh, in reality until they got a much more mature theater with specified missions. It was sort of like okay, we're going to utilize you for this. So at, at times, sometimes some of the soldiers that might have been trained to do something else were not doing the mission that they were trained for. But part of it was all working as a team. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's uh, hard to convince that, you know, 20 year old, uh, the boredom, because, uh, you know, for some of the younger kids, I think it was a tough, uh, a tough time. And, uh, you know, I often look back, could I have done what they did? I had mm -hmm. so much respect for them. Because even though I went to a military school, you know, you still have that social atmosphere. You're in college, you yeah. meet your friends. You're not being just plucked out of a school and go mm -hmm. into a desert for a year. Right. Uh, and one of the biggest things that we had to overcome was we constantly had to deal with some of the morale issues, because when we first arrived, we were thinking we were going to be going home at the end of the summer, and then it was found out it was going to be boots on the ground for a year. And of course, when that message came down, that was definitely uh, I think you could have heard a pin drop. Uh, you know, and this is insane. You could have still heard the pin drop into the sand. Because uh, it was mm -hmm. everybody was uh, not happy, but you know, being the battalion commander, uh, I had to tell my staff we got to make this a positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, they had started allowing two-week leave cycles, so soldiers were going to have an opportunity to go home. But of course, they had to come back, right. which I think eased a lot of it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it made it, it did make a huge difference. Did you have an opportunity for leave? I did. Mm -hmm. I actually came home uh, the first, uh, actually like. The first and second week, the second and part of the third, I arrived back there mm -hmm. 
uh, just before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think it was, uh, it would not, as a battalion commander or my staff, I did not want, we would not take the holiday times. We would be there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, it, was, it was good. It was uh, run a little bit different the first time. Uh, we actually went down to Kuwait. We actually had set up since we were, we had not just our headquarters, we had all our units going. Mm -hmm. So we were handling that function actually for the brigade as troops, you know, would get a sign that they were going on leave. We set up a thing at Doha uh, where uh, we would pick them up. You know, they would get on a C-130. They would fly down to uh, Doha and Kuwait. Mm -hmm. We would pick them up there. They would probably arrive the day before. They would get them over to Kuwait International mm -hmm. Airport. But that's when you would actually fly home in civilian clothes. Uh, as, as once again, mature third, it became that you would do its charter flights coming in and you would be flying home in your uniform and mm -hmm. uh, various like that. So, Let's get back to the locals for a second. Did you folks ever have problems with the locals? I mean, at first you were a little like, because it's the first year in terms of the security, so it was sort of tight, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, uh, scrutinized, uh, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the locals. But they actually, you know, it, we didn't really have too much trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think part of that is because southern Iraq is uh, uh, fairly Shia dominated. So they probably looked at it as a positive of us being mm -hmm. there. Uh, and probably Saddam was not too, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way, there was probably not an exchange of Christmas cards between Saddam mm -hmm. and the Shia. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it was, uh, you know, it was that first, and we ended up having like I think over time probably two thousand locals process to come on every day. Mm -hmm. They would go through a, a specific point, uh, and they would do various things. But it was just the very uh, uh, beginning of it uh, that we started handing because at the beginning there we did not have it was sort of a, when I keep using the word as the theater matured, as the mission matured, mm -hmm. as you took on more responsibility. So it was always like a, a building up, a ramping right. up in terms of missions. So that was sort of the, the last few months. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. that continued on where they were probably having many more come on and different specific things because mm -hmm. uh, KBR would hire some of the you know, various, various things they would do, clean the, the showers or you know, do various. But I, I, there wasn't really any security. I don't think anybody was really uh, mm -hmm. uh, concerned. Uh, now, you mentioned that your, um, your first time ended in April of... 2000 and this would be when we left we left February of 2003 into February okay. mm -hmm. we got over there uh, like May 2nd I think we flew of 2003 mm -hmm. and we were over there to the end of April of 2004 April 2004 okay right. and the last few weeks were before we left was spent in Kuwait mm -hmm. uh, so at that time when we first got over we didn't know how you know when they said boots on the ground they hadn't even selected the unit to replace you uh, as once again, as the mission matured, units mm -hmm. would know eight months out who was the unit going to replace them. It was already mm -hmm. chosen. You already knew who was coming in. And uh, so that you know, in itself, you could see time go by. It was sort of some unknowns, you know, okay, so it's boots on the ground. They don't have a unit selected for us, and you can't just leave until they have a unit that's going to come in and replace you and do that mission. Uh, so uh, that went, the units were arriving. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. they started off in Kuwait. They, they uh, convoyed in, you know, with their equipment mm -hmm. to... I think then they started just leaving it behind uh, for the next unit. So uh, your unit pretty much helped set up the structure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. It was a very big, uh, uh, you know, Tilo really grew during mm -hmm. that time. Uh, and there was uh, another camp uh, called Adder. Now I think the whole area was eventually called Logistical Support Area Adder, but mm -hmm. it was uh, Talil and Adder. And Adder was about eight miles away, a mm -hmm. uh, smaller base. Uh, and I remember. You know, the first time, just looking around Talil, the Army side, it looked terrible. And then I found, I went over to Adder to check up on some of my troops, and I didn't think there was a worse place than where we were at, but I quickly found out that that was, they were even living in a tougher <laughs> wow. condition. Because you had to deal with uh, a lot of these sandstorms. And so you could be out there, and just all of a sudden, sand, just like it would be, it would be like, you, you know, we have like a white out with snow. It would be a brown out with sand. Wow. And you would just be covered, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. And there's a lot of you know robbery. You know, you know. Of course, like uh, you know, some of the you know the the units underneath you, they see the sand heading toward the headquarters. They all cheering because <laughs> we're going to get it. <laughs> yeah. But it was, uh, and I I think what really, and just to get it back, and I'm probably going to every way, every way here. But uh, you know, morale, as I said earlier in the conversation, is a very big thing. I think what really helped that year were the Pats, the Patriots. 
uh, every week you know, when they started winning and then go into the Super Bowl, and they mm -hmm. won the Super Bowl. We did have a few units from North Carolina there, so they played the Carolina uh, 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 in the Super Bowl, oh, Carolina Panthers. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, very, in fact, our brigade headquarters was from uh, North Carolina. <laughs> So there was definitely uh, a lot of fun, like mm -hmm. in terms of that. And it, truly, you, you just look forward to watching it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you're watching it actually on a very small TV. Uh, and that year, the Red Sox, I think, uh, they went to the seventh game with the Yankees, and they got, a, you know, they got mm -hmm. uh, one game away from the World Series. Uh, so that was watching that. Of course, we're time-wise, we're, you know, like, Eight hours ahead, mm -hmm. so we're actually watching uh, uh, Pedro Martinez give up the hit, yeah. and this you know the angst on us like you know up oh, there goes the another year, and then we went right into the football, uh, mm -hmm. which kept us going, and I think that was a big mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, you know, I remember just putting some chairs on a table, and you're watching the small TV, <laughs> and you could barely see it. I mean, it was fuzzy, and it was like probably watching what TV was like in the 1950s or something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but yet you were excited. And uh, the morale every time the Pats won and then go into the Super Bowl. By that time, they'd actually refurbished the brigade headquarters. And as this sort of evolution sort of uh, happened in terms of when we arrived there, we would have meetings outside. It would be all the battalion commanders would meet with the brigade commander so you're, and his staff. So you're basically standing outside in 140 degrees heat standing and you're, you're sort of watching for to make sure that uh, some of these camel spiders that were around the area or scorpions are not going to be crawling around because you see these crevices in these walls like okay what's going to come up what's crawling me right now oh dear and it, to the point where they finally got a tent which was still warm inside but at least it was a tent so you got to sit down and you're using like an old projector for slides to definitely move in where they got the ac in there to the point where they actually went in and refurbished a, a new building. So when you were inside the building, you were felt like you could be in any office in the U.S. So it, it, you know, you started getting those creature comforts at home. They had desks, they had uh, you know office phones. Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was definitely you got a much you know like this is livable now. You know? Okay. And plus at that time the weather you know really you know was no more than like you know like maybe 55 or 50 during the day. You know maybe the nights were in the you know like 40s or something. Mm -hmm. Then it gradually was in the 60s, and you know, so it was actually very weather-wise. It was it was uh, really nice. I did a lot of a uh, lot of running there. Just uh, it allowed you to relax and mm -hmm. uh, you know, just running around this uh, lake that they had, uh, a really man-made lake that they had built, and just down this one path that you could see the runways. It was like about a three-mile run, but you just uh, it would be like in the mornings during the summer it would be like 95 and it was actually cool because it would be getting up to about 140 <laughs> right. during the day. <laughs> so, so now it's April of 2004 and... Yep, we come, uh, we come back. Mm -hmm. uh, so then my assignment is I go back to, uh, I think I did, uh, I worked on a special project for the Adjutant General in terms mm -hmm. of safety and convoy and what to prepare our units for as they head out because now more and more units were going. They had more of a predictable uh, schedule, you know, when units were going to, to get them. Because when this all hit, you were like when, the first year, you basically had like a few weeks to get everybody together to go and out mm -hmm. the door. So there's a lot of things you have to do uh, in terms of getting soldiers trained to get through the, out, out the door to make sure from just medically, just to making mm -hmm. sure that uh, they're medically set to go. Uh, but now it's much more predictable schedule. So then I went back out to the, uh, after I did that uh, special project, I went back out to the 79th Troop Command as their AO, uh, still, you know, executive officer. Uh, then a new brigade commander came in. Uh, so right around that time, now we're going into 2005, I was mm -hmm. uh, uh, picked to go back up to uh, Joint Force Headquarters and I was becoming the J-8, which is really your resource officer for the state. And it's an 06 position, so they put me in an 06 position. I'd been, while I was uh, deployed, I got selected. I came out on the, the DA list for 06. Mm -hmm. uh, but how it works on the active side of the guard, you have to wait till a resource comes open, because there's only actually four AGR resources for the 06s in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. California might have eight, or Texas might, because they're bigger states. Uh, so it's a limited number, so sometimes you almost have to wait till somebody retires. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came out on the list, and then in, uh, I did that uh, uh, job for about a, a year. It's in the USPFO. It's in the Property Fiscal Office. 
uh, you're considered like the director of the USBFO uh, office. So you oversee like the comptroller, you oversee the uh, supply and services, uh, property accountability, uh, you oversee uh, your data processing, uh, your contracting. So you oversee various, uh, uh, various functions that support the day-to-day -day operation for uh, any state. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I, a resource came open, and as a resource came open, I was selected for brigade command. So I took the uh, 79th Troop Command uh, for a couple of months, but they had a new uh, MTO coming in, uh, a, a regional support group, uh, and it was the 151. So I basically was at the 79th Troop Command for a couple of months and then took over the 151. And then lo and behold, we got notified that uh, we were going to be deployed. <laughs> so I was going back to Iraq. Uh, but it was a little bit different this time, totally different mission. Uh, you're actually doing a base defense mission, so it was much more of a combat arms type mission mm -hmm. that you were doing. Uh, you were overseeing uh, the entire Victory Base complex. So there's uh, mm -hmm. various camps within the Victory Base complex, like Victory itself, Camp Slayer, uh, Cropper, uh, Camp Cropper, all these various mm -hmm. different uh, Camp Liberty. Okay, and where exactly? That's where actually we're about? Uh, sort of southwest of Baghdad, mm -hmm. probably about ten miles, I'm guessing, uh, southwest of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. So different mission, and since my headquarters, it was sort of new, and I knew it wasn't a logistics mission. I had to sort of revamp my headquarters. I had to uh, take some people that have uh, like a military police background for security, people that have some combat arms experience, uh, military intelligence. So it's sort of a, it's not just combat arms, it's like combined arms. So it, the mission, because you're not only, you're, you're basically it's base defense, so you oversee all the entry control points, uh, you oversee the towers, uh, you oversee, uh, you provide security for the base. Uh, you also do presence patrols in the, in the outlying areas, like there's a couple, some villages, Iraqi family village, uh, Makassib, uh, we did patrols in. So it's, it's really a, like a, truly like a bind. You're not actually, nothing to do with logistics whatsoever. They had actually another command coming in that would handle the logistics mm -hmm. uh, support of the, uh, that would have the mayor cells that would handle the logistics part of the base. So I was sort of surprised because you know, regional support group is a logistics, it's, a, it's an 06 logistical command. Uh, but I think at the time it's plug and play and somehow our number came up to do that mission. So we were replacing a field artillery uh, brigade headquarters. But this time around, because you know you're going and when you're going, you have all this time to communicate with them, uh, start training the people, getting the people ready. So you definitely have more time to prepare, mm -hmm. which was very helpful. Uh, not really knowing the, the battalions that are going to be underneath you. Uh, so we were in communication with uh, the unit that we were replacing for, for a long time. Then we went to, a, we went to Fort Dix for our mobile station again. Uh, totally different because you're not convoying down. We actually bust down because you're going to fall on equipment over there. Uh, so totally different, you know, in terms from that of getting from point A to point B. Uh, fly mm -hmm. into Kuwait, you're now only going to be Kuwait about seven days to get acclimated do a few more uh, uh, training exercises. Uh, as simple as like a rollover on a Humvee, how would you exit the Humvee? Uh, just to make sure you check that block of training. And then they fly you C-130 up to uh, Baghdad to uh, buy up, you know, as you, uh, and then, uh, which was really part of buy up was Sather Air Force Base run by the Air Force. And mm -hmm. uh, that's where you pick up and you go through about a 10 day changeover and you take over the mission. And we fell under uh, the first CAV, was uh, Multinational Baghdad, Division Baghdad. And mm -hmm. uh, we fell under the first CAV. We were one of the brigade commands under the first CAV. Uh, so Our that, first CAV being? Down in Texas, Fort Hood. Okay. First CAV. Mm -hmm. Now they were, you know, different periods of time. So not only, we were under that, uh, them until about December. And then from December to April, we were underneath the uh, fourth ID. They came in mm -hmm. to replace the first cap. So uh, that was really a very, uh, to really see the war up close uh, and get involved. Uh, it was definitely totally different. And uh, the first deployment, 
even though they would come across, you know, there was constant explosions, it was basically old ordnance that they were exploding mm -hmm. that might have been dropped uh, from the first Gulf War. We really didn't have any incoming rockets coming mm -hmm. in. This was totally different. We had about 140 rockets come in during the course of the year, so you were under attack. Uh, several of our towers got attacked, uh, and then you had issues, uh, you know, you had situations out on the presence patrols. Uh, and it's funny, it was so much more structured, uh, whereas it was, I don't want to use the word loosey-goosey mm -hmm. for the first thing, because we would just get in a, it wasn't even an up-armored Humvee, and we would go over to Cedar, I would go to another camp and just drive ten, you know, there'd be four of us in the mm -hmm. vehicle, and, and not that we weren't armed, but uh, you know, sometimes we would take but, uh, these SUVs out. So obviously, at any time you went, were driving around, and sometimes I would occasionally think, because you know, they never really rounded up all the guys in Nazareth that did that attack. Uh, but this time going over there, the rules had changed. You, know, you left, you go out outside the wire, you're in a, uh, three to four Humvees, 50 cal mounted. Uh, I would have to go out occasionally to meet with the local sheikhs. Uh, it was really battalion driven because they had a certain AO and we had battalions that we had three or four uh, battalion task forces that worked for us and they would have a specific area that they would handle the western side of the VBC the, and mm -hmm. one group would have the southern side and the, you know, the uh, eastern side in terms of responding either like a quick reaction force if there was fire coming in uh, on the uh, tower. You know, and every morning you're briefing this to the, the division uh, command you know, like with battle updates and commander updates. So just the fact that in those four years of just from the, the technology advance of how they ran security versus where we were in Talil, like mm -hmm. sort of like in the infancy, had really changed. But the mission uh, and, and an opportunity to uh, uh, work for General Phil and uh, General uh, Hammond, who uh, General Phil commanded the first cab and General Hammond uh, commanded the uh, fourth ID, and you would have the chief of staff of the army that would come in, mm -hmm. so you'd have an audience. Just just the brigade commanders would be meeting with them. Uh, General Odinero. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was at that level you got to see some high level, uh, which was pretty uh, pretty unique. And uh, the the mission of the providing the you know the, the security was uh, very mm -hmm. important. Uh, I actually had a navy uh, kind of rocket team, uh, C-RAM battery, uh, that oversaw these phalanx guns. Uh, and the phalanx guns you would see on ships. And the theory was, they started this just before we got there. Uh, they've, uh, someone got the idea, well, you know, they use them on ships to shoot down rockets, so why don't we have them here? We'll put them land-based. But, you know, you've heard the term, a fish out of water. Well, if it's on a ship and a rocket's coming in, the, the software, you know, that programs it mm -hmm. is going to, you know, it's going to engage it, it, only if they see the rocket's going to come into its zone. If it's not going to come into its zone, they're not going to engage it and shoot it down because it's mm -hmm. just going to hit the water. It's a little bit different on land because it's going to come down on something. Right. <laughs> and that's, you know, that was the thing. And it was working out the mechanics mm -hmm. of it. And uh, over time, you know, like a warning system would go off. Uh, and that was really the key was getting that early warning so they would hear the alarm. It would give soldiers four to five seconds to hit the ground or maybe get into cover. Uh, because if it just all of a sudden hit, it, I mean, it, 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 and a few did hit, killing a few soldiers on, on boast, mm -hmm. uh, and just a shrapnel that would cause it uh, from when it would ever hit. And mm -hmm. you, and even though like 140 sounds like a lot, but it's over the course of the year, right? And it, it was a pretty big area, mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't uh, too bad. We did manage to shoot down a few, but the key was really getting that early warning system, knowing that something was coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, because even if it, we improved the radius of what area it would cover, but unless it was specifically going to come into that zone, it wouldn't react and fire. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and they, they could never really work that, work mm -hmm. that out. Uh, so, but it was, you know, every one that you did knock down, it was, it was a plus. And, uh, okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, when the rockets did attack and there were casualties and fatalities. Did you ever have to deal with that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, three days into my command, mm -hmm. uh, uh, battalion uh, out of first ID, mm -hmm. uh, out of Germany, uh, they uh, went out, they were going out on a patrol, and they lost uh, a soldier and an interpreter, got hit with an IED. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, it, it's sort of funny how four years can really change. I never really gave it much thought 
uh, my first uh, tour over there in terms of IDs. Uh, plus, many of them were very primitive. I mean, mm -hmm. if you saw something that looked funny, like in the, and it was such, it was so more open in southern Iraq mm -hmm. that it was sort of hard to just hide something. And if you saw something that looked unfamiliar, you just sort of stepped aside it. Uh, whereas uh, this time, you know, you're, you're outside of Baghdad. So, you know, there's villages, there's, uh, you know, uh, muhallas, as they would call them, uh, various, uh, you know, and it was just, you know, you, you would see something you could see, I can see how they could plant them. You wouldn't even know. I mean, even if you're going 25 miles an hour in that, in, in, in that Humvee, you're going so quick, how are you even noticing if it's not sitting in that trash that you just drove over mm -hmm. or something like that, and it's at night too. So that was a, a definite awakening experience to get woken up about three in the morning. And, uh, and it is very, I tell you, uh, uh, for anybody, I, I mean, I don't, even care if you're not in the uh, service, you know, when you see something like that and then have to see the, you know, the casket being uh, uh, put on the uh, aircraft to take it back to the States, uh, the memorial with the soldier, you know, that the, the units would do, uh, it, it really uh, just, you know, it's almost really hard to describe, but you, you really feel it, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, a young, young kid doesn't get to go home and uh, even that interpreter who was an Iraqi uh, citizen, uh, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't get to go. And was doing something pretty risky because a lot of them that took that job, even if they were paid fairly well, they're at risk. Right. I mean, you know, when they go back at night into their house or, or to that. And that's one of the things that people don't, you know, uh, they look at it, we're, we're fighting this money for them. They should be, in essence, thankful. But they're putting their life on the line too because if they're seeing, you know, the, many of, uh, you know, the people looked at us as the enemy. Mm. Even though we were trying to help, they looked at it, you know, uh, and, and it, you do have to, you have those cultural hurdles to try to overcome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they look at it, you're in a, you're in a Humvee, uh, you know, and you're patrolling, uh, how is, and they look at like, what we would consider like if the police or some type of security force or the military knocked on your door in the United States, you would look at it as, even if you, didn't like the military, you, you would feel at least they're here to help me. Mm -hmm. They have a different view. I mean, under Saddam, you know, if the military came to your house or the, their security forces came to your house, they weren't taking you to a parade. Mm. <laughs> and so it was a cultural hurdle. And I think General Petraeus, with the whole surge, and that's when we went over, was during the time of that surge in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big, that broke down a lot of things. And we obviously provided more troops, more security. But it was the way that they would do patrols. They did more dismounted patrols. So the people got to see them and meet the soldiers, which I think helped out a lot okay. uh, in terms of breaking down barriers and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. you always walk that line of safety versus you're out there, you know. So, I mean, right. you were out in the villages much more. Uh, you were infusing money into the local economy. Uh, we opened a market and uh, a grand opening. Like you, you know, just like you would have here, like the, you know, the Natick Mall. Of course, it didn't look anything like the Natick Mall, <laughs> but uh, you know, little stuff like that. And and then I, you know, I got to see where obviously some of them were living in some of the villages. And once again, you know, just how lucky we have it here in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, you just take too many things for granted. I mean, you know, four or five families living in one room. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, uh, and they're just looking for, you know, like. Many people, they're just looking for a better life. Right. You know? But uh, it was great, great experience, uh, opportunity to work with some of the, you know, the finest soldiers and airmen, you know, and even sailors. I oversaw sailors, so that was why it was a unique command. Mm -hmm. uh, very fortunate. Uh, they all did a fantastic job, and uh, they l made me look very good. So, uh, I mean, I owe them a lot. Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have some really strong NCOs. Uh, you know, the first sergeants and the platoon sergeants mm -hmm. uh, that did just an outstanding, outstanding job. Mm -hmm. you know, excellent leaders. So how long was the second tour? Uh, another year. We was mm -hmm. on the ground for a year. And that uh, was? So that, that took us up until uh, from basically we got over there in uh, May of 07. Uh, and then we came back at the end of April of uh, 08. Actually, I think by the time we finally got back, it was like beginning of May. By the time we got, because mm -hmm. you go back to your mob station for about five days to help process. Right. So, and then from there, mm -hmm. uh, I still was in the command. 
Uh, I took the command until September of 08. Mm -hmm. And then I came back up to be the J-8 resource officer again at state headquarters. Mm -hmm. And then in August of 2009, I became the, uh, got assigned down to the National Guard Bureau, but attached back up as the United States property fiscal officer. So I had the responsibility, my last three years, uh, I had the responsibility of overseeing all the federal dollars uh, and federal par uh, property that comes into both the Mass Army Guard and the Massachusetts Air Guard. Mm -hmm. And there's a USPFO in all the 54 state and territories. Every state has one, so does Guam, mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and DC, DC has a USPFO. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, not really having a, a money background, a mm -hmm. uh, unique experience, mm -hmm. but I had, once again, had excellent people uh, working. You have about a full-time staff of about 60 people, uh, both mm -hmm. civilian and military, uh, handling the money side, the comptroller's office, to the contracting side, uh, to uh, supply and services, property accountability. Mm -hmm. You're also dealing with the Air Guard side, so you oversee those federal dollars that, mm -hmm. that come in. And where were you stationed? Right in Milford is where I was. And were you still a lieutenant colonel? Or? No, I was, uh, I was promoted to 06 in mm -hmm. uh, uh, January of, uh, uh, was it? No, December of 2005, I was promoted okay. to 06. So before I took the brigade command, mm -hmm. I was already uh, promoted to 06. Okay. So the last three years you were working in National Guard Bureau, overseeing federal? Mm -hmm. Dollars, and yeah. retired uh, in June of 12. June of 12. Yeah. June 30th to be exact. I helped process down at Fort Myer and mm -hmm. came back up here and, uh, mm -hmm. and put my hat in the ring for state representative. <laughs> okay, and uh, what are you doing these days? Uh, you know, doing a few things, getting involved obviously with the Friends of the Fourth, mm -hmm. uh, doing some things with the VFW, uh, mm -hmm. part of the VFW uh, in Natick. Uh, and I'll probably be looking to take advantage of the GI Bill and mm -hmm. go back and get another master's degree. Okay. Now, according to your biography you posted last year, when you were running for state rep, you, I believe you had two bronze? Uh, yes. Two yeah. bronze stars, stars or two bronze medals? Uh, two bronze stars. How did you get those two bronze stars? Both were from the two tours. Uh -huh. uh, one is when I had the battalion in 2003-2004 overseas at Talil. And then I got uh, awarded uh, for when I had the brigade command uh, mm -hmm. in 2007 to 2008 over in Baghdad. Was that for overall command or was there any specific? No, it's, it's for the command. It's for the, for the mm -hmm. tour. You, uh, it's, you cannot get that in a peacetime mission. Right. Uh, it's only, uh, and it's really, uh, you know, the soldiers mm -hmm. got that, the, the outstanding job that the soldiers that uh, had the experience to oversee and work with, uh, the outstanding job that they did. And I, I think they lean more toward, you know, in the leadership positions that you have, because mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to sort of, you, you, you handle a lot of other issues, not just the mission itself, but uh, you're responsible for the morale. You're, you're yeah. uh, responsible for policing up the, and just on a larger scale, the brigade. Right. Uh, and you had, you know, uh, soldiers will be soldiers. It will be like anywhere in the U.S. or mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Uh, kids of younger age or, or people will do some dumb things. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, it's part of it. And you had to, you know, oversee and uh, sometimes, you know, you had to uh, administer mm -hmm. uh, some punishment. Right. But uh, you had to handle it uh, in different ways. But uh, as, as I said, uh, I think part of that is just... Uh, probably inherent with any battalion commander, brigade commander, or even a company commander, or similar to like a first sergeant mm -hmm. uh, or a sergeant major, a command sergeant major of a battalion, the ranking NCO of that battalion, uh, the responsibilities go far beyond what the duty description uh, mm -hmm. would say. Now, did you receive any other medals or accommodations? Uh, through the various career, I, I got uh, several merit, uh, a few meritorious uh, service awards, uh, uh, I think I ended up with five Army Accommodation Awards, a uh, couple of Air Force Accommodation uh, Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still actually, uh, my retirement ward is still en route, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, I never like to jinx anything until I know <laughs> if I received it or not. Uh, but uh, uh, for my time as a USPFO, I, I received the Defense Meritorious uh, Service Award. So it's a joint award. Uh, so. But, uh, and then there's, you have all the other ones that just by purely, like, I got a combat mm -hmm. readiness medal because I was a combat crew commander. 
you know, it's more that you're in the position or the time you served X number of years, you get this award mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's uh, sometimes you don't keep track and then you mm -hmm. try to, as you're retiring, you're trying to get everything recorded and then you leave out a few. So I still right. actually have to put a few more down uh, and send forward. Mm -hmm. Looking back, you, you're just getting out of the Army after 30 years. Uh, what's the overall impression? Very positive, mm -hmm. you know, extremely positive, in fact. Uh, uh, I was just, as I, you know, just very fortunate. I worked with some excellent people. Uh, and I think that's the real, you know, it's a sense of you're part of something, you know, something that you're, it's bigger than you, uh, and you feel you're doing something, I think, very worthwhile. Uh, like any avenue that anyone chooses in, in life, uh, mm -hmm. there's probably pros and cons, you know, the, the pluses and the minuses. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, there are a few minuses in that type of, you know, moving around, uh, Obviously, you know, two tours. Uh, right. Uh, and, you know, dealing with uh, things, but what helps you get through is that you're part of a team. And mm -hmm. the pros for me far outweighed, the pluses for me far outweighed any neg negative uh, for that career. And I, mm -hmm. I think also I had the fortunate experience to be part of two services, mm -hmm. you know, and I still keep in contact with guys that I served with in the Air Force. Uh, uh, and obviously keep in contact with every, even people that I had deployed with because they they came from different commands You know, they weren't it wasn't just from Massachusetts that you oversaw, mm -hmm. you know, so it was uh, it was great uh, Just a great experience. I look back at it with very fond memories yeah. uh, As far as Iraq is concerned, we've been involved now for 10 years. Hopefully the end is in sight um, Any overall comments or impressions about that? Well, I guess now that I'm a, a civilian, I, I get to uh, speak more uh, candidly, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, my views on that is uh, I look at Saddam had to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, unfortunately, in this world, uh, maybe I'm, I'm looking at more from a historical point of view. Uh, you know, he was a dictator, uh, and he was a very uh, ruthless dictator that the only difference between a, someone like Saddam and an Adolf Hitler and a Joseph Stalin uh, is that he didn't have the toys to play with. You give him the toys, would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt in my mind. Because uh, the way they look at life, uh, it doesn't, you know, they, they look at life different than the way that the West looks at life. So it's, and uh, he had to go, now, one could argue our approach in doing that in terms of maybe we could have waited a little bit longer and built a stronger coalition. Uh, you know, something that the, uh, pr the, the senior, uh, you know, the, in the first Gulf War, President Bush, his father, I, I, you know, built a very strong, it got the Arab community involved. Uh, something that maybe the younger son, you know, the son did not do. But in, in defense, you know, 9-11 hadn't happened mm -hmm. yet in 1991. So that could have changed the table a little bit. And I think any time you can go into a country uh, and give them hope and opportunity, but where is the end? I think in, uh, in a, in people do have some valid, like, how long does that last? How much money do we pour in there? When do they take the lead? And I think it's, it's probably too early to tell, but, you know, you know, I personally don't think it, things look as strong in Iraq after we left. But does that mean we stay there forever? I mean, it, it, there's a lot of questions to have, but I do think as a, you know, as the United States, we're, we are, I consider us, you know, we're leaders of this world. We, you know, we, we help people. That's, I think, ingrained to every American citizen that we mm -hmm. like to help people. And I, I think what you have to then weigh is at what cost. You know, what, you mm -hmm. know, uh, but, you know, I, I think Saddam truly had to go. And the longer he stayed in power. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think he was being looked at and possibly being top. I, I, you know, my personal belief is that he played that shell game uh, with the, uh, in terms of the weapons of mass destruction and moving everything around, I think he played it not for the benefit of the United States. He played it because I think he was worried about Iran or Syria coming in. Right. And I think uh, both those countries, who are very Shia dominated, uh, look at uh, looked at Saddam as being weak. You know the infrastructure, but they realized he did use weapons of mass destruction against Iran in the 80s. Used mm -hmm. them on his own people, so maybe he does have them. And, uh, and I think what better way than taking on the U.S. because you're gonna, the press is going to cover it, you know, and thumbing your nose that the U.S. is going to get world coverage mm -hmm. and that, you know, that's going to make other countries think. 
I think he just probably did not gamble. He didn't think the U.S. would come in. And uh, I think that's where he was, mm -hmm. you know, obviously mis mistaken. But it's a long, I mean, it's the same thing in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which I think is actually a tougher situation. Because uh, one advantage we had in Iraq is with Al-Qaeda, as bad as they were, and initially how they got the locals involved and, you know, sort of like, you know, well, you're not from Iraq, but you hate America, we hate America, like type attitude. Uh, eventually that wore thin, and we were able to breach that uh, by breaking some of the cultural hurdles. I think by getting out with dismounted patrols, fusing more money into the combat, I mm -hmm. think they saw a different picture. And Al-Qaeda was fanatics, but they were still outsiders. Right. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan, the Taliban is more woven into the fabric of the country. So it's a little tougher cultural thing to get over. And the influence on the Taliban into that local community is much stronger than Al-Qaeda had in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really helpful to our advantage and it makes it a little bit tougher in Afghanistan, okay. you know, to do that. Well, Bill, is there anything else you'd like to say for those who are going to be watching this in the future? Uh, just uh, I enjoyed this. It was a great experience, and uh, I truly appreciate uh, the opportunity and to discuss uh, some of my past uh, career. And uh, I thank you very much for having me on today. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's. Uh, just, I guess if I could add one thing, I said mm -hmm. I'm a very fortunate individual mm -hmm. uh, to have worked with so many fine soldiers and airmen and sailors uh, throughout my career. And mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, I miss, I miss the time in the service, but uh, I look forward to the rest of the years of my life. Okay. Well, Bill Callahan, we thank you for coming and interfering for the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you. Mm -hmm.